Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Be the Gospel with our teacher, Anthony Tijerina. Tonight he's going to teach us how to be a conduit for the Holy Spirit in the proper scriptural way. Welcome to the program, Anthony. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I was. Uh, my dog is being a little... Um, He's trying to go in and out of where I'm at. So <laughs> I was talking to him just now. <laughs> <laughs> they do, The animals well, do tend to want attention when you have to give it elsewhere, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, right now he's, he's looking for my wife, and she's she's in the garage doing some stuff. But, but yeah, um, definitely want to pick up where we left off last time and – uh, one of probably one of the the most simplest things for us to do is walk in the spirit, and a lot of times we think that it's so complicated and it's so hard because we overthink it, and you find that as we as we begin to walk in the spirit and be a conduit for the Holy Spirit. It, it's actually rather simple, and the more you do it, the more it reinforces that. So just to let you in on a little secret, one of the things that we do as people is we see something, especially if we don't like change, and we say that is hard. And psychologically, what that, ha- what, what that produces, what happens is your mind shuts down immediately. It's hard. I can't do it, right? You stop thinking about it. And if you look at something and you say, oh, that's easy. I can do that. Then you begin to figure out a way, create a way to make it happen. So a lot of times we defeat ourselves before we even try because we think, oh, it's impossible. Oh, it's hard. And and we shut our minds down. And this is basically one of the things we're going to be covering today, and that's the mindset of carnality. It's the mindset of the flesh. But if you look at it and say, oh, it's easy, then what does it do? It gets your mind rolling. It gets it, gets it moving to where the Holy Spirit, all he has to do is direct it and guide it. Because it's easier to 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 steer a moving car, even if it's not on. Try turning the wheel when you're just sitting in it, and you'll see it's super hard to do. Oh, but get some motion behind that car. All of a sudden, it's so much easier to steer, and it's the same thing with us, especially with our thoughts and and how we do things, and you begin to realize that being a conduit of the Holy Spirit is – Jesus made it so simple. He made it so easy for us. And it's not complicated at all. It's it's just simple and easy. I mean, there's no other way to put it. <laughs> so when as I'm going over this, you're going to have some aha moments, I'm sure. And basically, I'm going to be going over Romans chapter 8 and really diving into this and exposing carnal mindsets, also spiritual mindsets. Because a lot of times... We think we're spiritual because of the things we do, and that's just simply not true. We are spiritual because of who we are in Christ as a new creation. So as John Lake says, it, it's in the being, not in the doing. It's the nature of God that makes us Christian, that makes us Christ-like. And a lot of times we think, oh, it's because I go to church. I I do this, I do that. But that qualifies us for being spiritual, and it's the farthest thing from the truth. What makes you spiritual is that you've been born anew. You've been born of heaven, and you abide in Christ, who walked in the Spirit all the time. So... Let's dive into this because I don't want to waste too much time, you know, talking about 
what we're going to cover, and let's just actually cover it. Sound good? All right, so here we go. Starting in verse 1, it says, now, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's very simple. And I know some some Bibles continue, and they say, who walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. And in Greek, it's not there, but we do find it a couple of scriptures later, and we'll get there in a second. And so if it's there or not, it's not a big deal because it's already, we, we know it's there in scripture. Okay? So, but what I want to point out just real quick off the bat is there's absolutely no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you're condemning yourself, you're not in Christ. Now, listen to what I said. If you are condemning yourself or if you're allowing the devil to condemn you, then you are stepping outside of Christ. Instead of just absolutely trusting in him and that it's done, also that God gives mercy. He's very he's a merciful God and that he desires mercy over sacrifice then it helps so many things in so many areas, right? So let's look at verse 2. It says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Now you notice there's no prerequisite here. It says the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So if you look at the laws of the kingdom of God, and we look at the laws of the kingdom of the devil, this becomes very clear. This becomes blatantly clear that the spirit of God brings life, that God's kingdom is health, is life, is wholeness, is, is purity, holiness, righteousness, so many things, all good. And we look at the devil's kingdom. Right? Sin, sickness, death, lack, depravity, shame, all these other things that are all completely part of his kingdom. So you can see where Paul is he's looking at us from a legal point of view and saying, For the law of the spirit of life has set you free, not will set you free, but has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Now you find that most of the, the issue is that we're trying to live in the kingdom of God, but abiding by the kingdom of the devil's laws. And it's just completely unacceptable. It doesn't work that way. If I go to Brazil, I can't operate under the U.S. law. It just doesn't work that way at all. And so it's the same with spiritual, spiritual kingdom or physical kingdom, right? So verse 3 says, For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk according to the flesh who walk who walk not according to the flesh excuse me but according to the spirit now let's let's back up a little bit. Let's, let's go back and let's let's break this down. It says, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. The law could not make us righteous, or else there's no reason for the law. I mean, there's no reason for Jesus to come, right? But what did it do? It, it exposed sin. It, it identified sin. Showed our shortcomings. So there's a purpose for the law itself. But weakened by the flesh. We can never fulfill the law because of the, the the fleshly nature, the carnal nature of fallen man. We couldn't fulfill the law, but but God sent His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh because it had no part of Him. It had no part of His nature. Have you ever wondered why you know God the Father in some way didn't come down and basically you know. Um, implant the seed in Mary. No, it was it was the Holy Spirit who came, right? Because this is one of the, the things in history. It's, it's one of the things that they understood was spirit and body. 
And so the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, and she conceived. And so we're not going to go into all that. But if you begin to think about it, the very Spirit of God, who knows the mind, the heart, the will, and we're going to be getting into that in a second, of God, he, he basically gave the seed to Mary, and Jesus was born as a result. Which is very interesting. And so when you realize that his his nature isn't from the Adamic side, which you know, some people say come from the father's side because Adam when he fell, when when Eve ate, nothing happened. But as soon as Adam did, something happened, right? So given all to all that technical stuff, but you begin to realize that he condemned sin in the flesh because sin was not part of his nature. Now, he was tempted, just like Adam and Eve were tempted, except for Jesus overcame it, and, and sin had no place in him. So in order that righteous, the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, we walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Thank God. So let me read a little more so you can, you can see what he's referring to. So verse 5. He says, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, and those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, and to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Hmm, interesting, right? For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Your, your version might say, ad enmity against God. Or towards God. For it does not sound, no, sorry, it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So, when you're reading this, if you don't understand what Paul's driving at here, it's very easy to say, well, hey, I have a body. I, I'm in the flesh. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about if you're, if you're operating under a fleshly nature, of course, you're never going to please God because the, the, the nature of the flesh is always to please its own self. It's completely selfish. While operating according to the Spirit is completely selfless. So you, you begin to see what he's exposing here. He, he's exposing mindsets. He's exposing thought life and thought patterns. Now, if you're not thinking... According to the Spirit, 100% of the time, don't beat yourself up. This is something that you learn. This is something that you renew your mind to that's covered in Romans 12. And all it is is being obedient to the Word of God and doing the Word of God, and that's how you renew your mind. It's very simple. It's not complicated. It's not New Age tactics. It's not anything else. It's just obeying God's Word, and that's how you walk in the Spirit. Yeah, it's, it's very simple. But if we actually pay attention, if we just kind of do some, some deep thinking, we know that everything first starts with the thought before we act. It starts in our mind. You, you have a thought, and then, it, and then it forms into an action. Right? And we're, we're not even going to get into habits and how all that works yet. But I want to show you that the mind of the flesh, the mind of a carnal nature, is at war against God. Because God says one thing in your flesh, and, and the devil says a different thing. For instance, if, if the easy way to look at this is money, right? The carnal mind says, I need to hold on, I need to save, I need to accumulate more and more stuff and things. Well, God says, give freely. You have freely received, freely give. Where your treasure is, your heart is also. So store up treasures in heaven. Right? You begin to look at this, and, and God begins to, to expose, where is, your, where is your mind at? Where is your heart at? Because if you're thinking constantly on fleshly things, the only thing you will ever reproduce is flesh. If you put your mind on spiritual things, like obeying his word, laying hands on the sick, casting out demons, loving your neighbor, forgiving, 
being at peace, walking in unity, loving, right? All the things that characterize the very nature of God that we call the fruit of the Spirit. And you notice it doesn't say fruits, it says fruit of the Spirit. These are basically the ways the Spirit thinks. He thinks the best. He thinks encouragement. He doesn't suffer thinking. Let me, let me go back and identify some of the things of the flesh, the mind of the flesh. The mind of the flesh will say, I'm a realist. Yep, yep, busted you. Some of you. I'm just saying how things are. Well, we're as believers, we have power in our words. We create situations with our words. Because belief is a powerful thing. It cuts both ways. It can can draw you closer to God or it can push you further away from God. It can draw you closer to the devil or push you further away from the devil. So when you look at this and you begin to realize that what you believe plays a a huge part in this because first it originates as a seed, as a thought. So you're either going to trust God or you're not going to trust God. You're going to trust that his word is true, and being obedient to his word is going to produce life and peace. While the carnal mind is saying, look, this is just how it is. This is the way natural things flow. Exactly. Right? Because you'll catch yourself saying these different things. If, if you actually play it all the way out, you realize you push God out. There's no room for the supernatural. There's no room for the spirit of God. Because you're saying, this is just how it is. And that's where we go wrong in so many different ways. We think, oh, this is is how it is. And we stop thinking. Remember what I was talking about at the very beginning. We stop thinking because we're like, oh, this this is how it is. It's hard. It's complicated. It's impossible. But Jesus says, all things are possible to them who believe. Now, understand what I'm saying here. It's not what you believe, it's who you believe. Now, think about that. It's not what you believe, it's who you believe. Because if you believe God, you're going to walk in the Spirit. You are created as a spiritual being. You've been born and born of heaven by the Spirit. Referencing John chapter 3. And even later on here, you'll see, it says, if you don't have the spirit of Christ, you don't belong to him. Something interesting, right? Because here it's saying, you are born of God. You're born of the spirit. So when you understand that you're born of the spirit, you're automatically spiritual. And if you're automatically spiritual then you need to mind the things of the Spirit. And as you set your mind on the things of the Spirit, it's life and peace to you. You know, there's a psalm that says that the unrighteous, that God is not in all their thoughts. Now imagine that. It says for the unrighteous, God is not in all their thoughts. So it also means the opposite is true. For the righteous, God is in all their thoughts. Now isn't that interesting? Because a realist will say, well, there's things in the world that I just have to take care of, and, and if I don't do them, who's going to do them, right? <laughs> I know. I've said it. You probably said it at different times, but hey, we're not supposed to stay in the flesh. We're supposed to grow out of the flesh into the spirit and grow up into Christ Jesus. So here we find that the flesh is constantly at war it's completely against God, and it doesn't understand God. It can't submit itself to God because of the very nature of flesh, the carnal nature. It can't submit itself to God at all because it goes against the very nature of who it is, of, of what it is, the essence of what it is. Now, this is very interesting. There's a story that, that completely captures this. And it's a story of a young boy and a rattlesnake, and, and this boy's up in the mountains, and there's this rattlesnake, and the rattlesnake is, is asking for mercy because it's cold and he can barely move. 
because they're cold-blooded animals. And so he picks up the snake, puts him in the bag after, you know, arguing with the snake. No, I'm not going to take you because then you'll bite me and then I'll die. And he's like, no, I promise I won't bite you. I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise I won't bite you. So the boy, against wisdom, picks up the snake, puts him in the satchel, takes him down the mountain where it's nice and warm, reaches into the satchel, the snake bites him. And the young boy tells the snake, you promised. And the snake replies to him, you knew what I was from the beginning. And another version says, you knew my nature from the beginning. It was in his nature to bite. So you see, the the carnal side, it's in its nature to rebel against God, to be hostile against God. It can't submit itself to God because it stands for everything that is against God. But, beloved, you've been born of the Spirit. You're already spiritual. Because if you're born of the flesh, which we are as soon as you're born into this world, we're born of the flesh, you know, we can see that we can't please God because it goes against the very nature of who we are. Now, let's look at verse 9. It says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Can I get an amen? You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And if it, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. So does the Spirit of God dwell in you? It's a simple yes or no question. Some of you might say, I don't know. Well, it's very simple. You invite the Spirit of God into your life. You believe in Jesus Christ. And that's it. We see that Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent. Change the direction. Change your thinking, which changes your direction. Forgive me. And be immersed... So he says baptized, so people automatically think water, but it doesn't say that. He says be immersed into Jesus Christ for the, emission, the remission of sins. His water doesn't wash away sins, his blood does. And you shall receive the gift or the gratuity of the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit of God dwells in you. And look what it continues on. It says, it says, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Huh. Not only that, but if we actually take time, I can take you through multiple books where it says that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, by the Holy Spirit. We're sealed to that day by his Holy Spirit. So he is the seal. Why? Because we're marked by his nature, the very nature of who he is, of by Genesis. That's why we produce the fruit of the Spirit. See, a lot of people, they look for power as an evidence of the Spirit. But we can see the devil also walks in power. But what sets us apart is the fruit that identifies. You will know a tree by the fruit it bears. Now, don't get mistaken. A lot of people will confuse works as fruit. That's not fruit. Fruit is patience, love, peace, joy, long-suffering, right? Even mercy. And you see all these things that are listed in Galatians chapter 5, 22-23. And it says there's no law against such because God cannot limit his nature by the law. And this is very interesting. Now let's go back to, to Romans 8, verse 10. It says, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, we use the word righteousness, but in Greek and other languages where I've been around the world, it's the word justice. Now, think about that. So the spirit is life because of justice. Well, who executed justice on our behalf? Jesus did. He condemned sin in the flesh. He blotted out the ordinances that were written against us. 
He executed justice, not only on our behalf, but he executed justice against the devil. Because sin didn't originate with us, it originated with the devil. Which is interesting. So the spirit of his life because of justice. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now look at this. He's talking about your physical body when he says mortal body, but the whole time he's been using the word flesh before this, right? So you see, there's a differentiation. He's not saying carnal flesh. He's saying it's this very nature of the flesh or a carnal nature, and he's identifying that, and he's identifying that the mortal body is completely different. Not only that, but that you have the Spirit of God in you who, who dwells who dwelt and dwells in Christ Jesus, who raised him from the dead, who's been present at every healing and miracle and supernatural event throughout the eternity. Since he dwells in you, he gives life to your mortal body. This is through his spirit who dwells in you. Come on. That's what we're shouting about. See, a lot of people think they need my hands or somebody else's hands to to be laid on them to be healed. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't need that. You need to come to the understanding, power of God that is at work in us because it's the very nature of God by his spirit that releases life even into our mortal bodies and heals us. And to be a conduit of the Holy Spirit is simply understanding that you are spiritual. You are spiritual because he dwells in you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't come and go. He doesn't come and go. He abides in you. First John 2, 20 and 27. You have anointing that abides. When you look at it from this perspective, I'm telling you, it changes everything. Look at verse 12. So then, brethren, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. See, we owe, but we don't owe the flesh. It's not about living according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. If you live according to a carnal nature, you will die. Verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, look at this context. This is something to pay attention to. A lot of people want to quote verse 14 without looking at verse 13, without looking at verse 12. It says, verse 13, and we're going to roll right into 14. And watch this. It says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, the deeds of the body, you will live. Verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God, sons of God. Now watch this, verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. By whom we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, co-heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Oh, he brought up suffering. Listen to some of you, huh? So let's back up a little bit. Let's cover a lot of ground here. But you can see that if you're led by the Spirit of God, you put to death the deeds of the body. So what are the deeds of the body? What's the deeds of the flesh? Well, you can see it's bitterness, unforgiveness, envy, hatred, gossiping, slandering. All these things that are listed out in, in several of the books that Paul wrote because he's saying, hey, you know, even in Colossians chapter 3, don't let these deeds be named among you. Put them to death. 
And it's very simple to put these things to death because we say, I am dead with Christ. Because I'm dead with Christ, I'm alive with. And we can see that in Romans chapter 6. We can see that in Colossians chapter 2. So it's this understanding that, hey, the old me is dead. The de- the old me that had a sinful nature and a carnal nature and a, a fleshly nature, they're dead. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I've been born anew. Watch this. Look, but listen to this. So even if you had tons of generational curses, let's say I actually believe in that, you know, according to uh, Exodus 18, also in Jeremiah, they completely destroyed that whole argument, even from the Old Testament standpoint. But let's say we believe that there's generational curses, then you would see that those have all been wiped out because you're dead. But now, since you've been born anew, you've been born of heaven, your generation goes back one, and that's to Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? And you see, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Those who have the nature of God by his Spirit are sons of God. Those who are led by the nature of God are sons of God. Who put to death the deeds of the body. For you did not receive the spirit of fear, the, 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 the spirit of slavery, excuse me. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. See, fear is, is a motivator, but it's a horrible motivator. And that's what the devil uses. He uses fear to capture, to keep you in bondage, to keep you imprisoned. Fear, fear of public speaking, fear of, of lack, fear of, of not measuring up, fear of rejection, fear of death, fear of looking bad. Instead of realizing, I'm already dead. Christ has already made me a winner. I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. I go from victory to victory. I'm not one who shrinks back because God takes no pleasure in those who shrink back. But I press forward. I press towards the calling, the high calling in Christ Jesus. Then you begin to realize you're no longer a failure because Jesus is not a failure He is victorious, and he has made you part of his body. What's amazing is if you go to Ephesians, there's chapter 5, verse 30. It says, you are made bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. He has made you part of his body, and there's no part of his body that is a failure. There's no part of him that's in fear. Free you. The law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. You've been freed, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry out the Son. Now, isn't this amazing? Because when you realize what it's saying here, we're adopted. God chose us part of his family. And his spirit Himself, the Spirit Himself, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children of God, then heirs, and heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, we're co heirs with Christ. Provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. That's one of the words that turns Christians off, but you have to understand I'm, this isn't talking about sickness, sickness is nowhere here. In fact, it's talking about healing concerning our mortal bodies. But here it's talking about suffering. Look at verse 18. It says, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits for, with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. So let's back up verse 18. Let's look at this. For I, for I consider that the sufferings of this present age are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed 
to us. So what is he talking about? Paul talks about being beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, left for dead, hungering, all these things for the cause of Jesus Christ. And sometimes we cry about missing a meal. How good we have it in the States. But the thing is, is not holding back, not shrinking back because of comfort, because it's what I'm used to. God is starting up something. He's stirring up the body, and he's beginning to see it everywhere. Men of God in, in, in higher influential positions are starting to take notice that God is beginning to move. And it's no longer about comfort. It's no longer about staying back. It's no longer about shrinking back. But about pressing into the high calling, the God calling you out from among the rest of everyone else. Because he has a plan and a purpose for you. And creation is waiting, longing for you to manifest as the son of God, to reveal yourself as the son of God. Now, why would creation long for that? Because you have to remember, Genesis chapter 3, creation's under a curse. To be, to be lifted, from, to be freed from the curse requires that sons of God manifest on the earth. Verse 20, creation was subjected to uh, fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope or in expectation that the creation itself will be free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of of the children of God. Exactly what I'm sharing with you. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For for this hope is for in this expectation we were saved. Now expect that is now expectation that is seen is not expectancy. For who expects and what they see? But if we expect for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Verse twenty six. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Our weakness. But we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for us. Now, understand, this does not refer to praying in tongues. This is saying that the Spirit himself intercedes for us. And it can't, in another text, uh, translation, it says, too deep for utterings. Utterings too deep to be uh, murmured or, or said or spoken. So this clearly is not talking about tongues. Just clearing that from your mind real quick. Verse 27. And who, who, he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Come on. The very Spirit of God who knows the mind of God is interceding for us. Saints, believers, adopted sons of God, children of God, he's interceding for you right now. And you think it's so hard in your situation, you think it's so hard to be healed. You think, come on, you have the very Spirit of God interceding for you. The problem is we put ourselves in the way. Bottom line, the carnal mind is always trying to earn something from God, trying to do something for God so that you can receive preference. But God doesn't show partiality to anyone. He just shows no favoritism to anyone. And this is important to understand and know. It rains on the just and the unjust. All the same. But he's looking for those who are willing to trust him and completely surrender to him and begin to live out of the spirit and truly worship God in spirit and in truth. Because understand, worship's not singing songs, that's praise. You never find praise and worship in the same sentence. You never find it anywhere in scripture together. But you find worship 
You see, they go down and they would go into the presence of a king and they would fall down and worship. What are they saying? They're saying, I submit myself to your rule, to your kingdom completely, utterly and completely. Completely different. But God is looking for people who are willing to operate out of the the nature of the spirit instead of the nature of the flesh. So verse 27, it says, he knows, it says, he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Verse 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So it's not just, oh, I'm just going to bless everyone. I'm just going to release blessings on everyone. No, no, no. It's for a particular purpose. God is very purposeful. He's a purposeful God. He doesn't doesn't waste. He blesses. And that's something very deep. If you caught that or not, um, blow on it, and it will reveal itself to you. Verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he has predestined, he has also called. And those he has called, he has also justified. And those whom he has justified, he also glorified. So understand what it's saying is, hey, we are in the same image of Jesus Christ. We have the same anointing as Jesus Christ because we can see that through Acts 10.38. That Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with dunamis, which is an inherent power by virtue of a person or a thing's nature, in this case, the very nature of Jesus, the very nature of the Holy Spirit produces power as a byproduct, not as a prime product, but as a byproduct, just like light naturally dispels darkness, right? And you see that we are made, we are conformed, we are predestined to be conformed to the very image of Jesus Christ, who is glorified, sitting at the right hand of God in heaven, that's why I'm telling you, man, if you can understand uh, out of everything I've been sharing with you, that you are spiritual. You operate in the spirit and you don't even know it. Born of the spirit and you don't even know it. Because for some reason you've divided it, you've pushed it away, you've cast it off. As being something second rate or something that you do religiously. And that's not what it's saying in Scripture at all. It's not about being religious. It's not about a tradition. It's understanding that you have been born of the very nature of God. And from his nature naturally flows out of you healing and prophecy and edification and encouragement and changing situations and days and being the remedy and the solution and the answer in situations that you find yourself in because you represent his son. You represent God. On this earth. That's why he's called you an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Tell me, this is absolutely amazing. Not only that, he's predestined us to be in Christ Jesus. He's predestined everyone to be in Christ Jesus. He desires that no one should perish. That all would come to the knowledge of the truth. Not only that, but he's justified us who have been called, who have come into Christ Jesus. And not just justified, but also glorified. God has glorified you in Christ Jesus. Let's look at verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, come on. You see the context? You see what God has laid out here in Scripture? If God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 32. And who, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God is not holding anything back from you. I don't care what you've heard in the past. I don't care if you think there's a season or a blessing or anything like that that you think God is holding back for a different time. Ah, bah humbug. It's rubbish. Giving you everything in Christ Jesus. Verse 33. 
Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So remember, we were talking about the Spirit of God interceding for us, and now we have Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, interceding for us. So if you know the power of agreement, you got the Spirit of God and you have Jesus Christ interceding for us. And we know just off of Jesus alone, he got everything he prayed for. He gets everything he prays for. And he's interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tri- tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you realize, 1 Corinthians six seventeen, that he who's joined with the Lord has become one spirit with him. Nothing that can separate us from his love Absolutely nothing You abide in the spirit By surrendering To the very nature Of his son That is in you A nature of service A nature of selflessness A nature of giving A nature of of loving and, And putting others before self A nature that doesn't keep record of wrong. The nature that is not self-seeking. The example that he said. Abiding in the spirit. Abiding in his spirit. And being the conduit of the Holy Spirit. Is so simple. It's so easy. Jesus did the hard part. He's the one who lived the perfect life. He's the one who, could sin, who, who condemned sin in the flesh. He did what the law wasn't able to do. He did all the heavy lifting. And that's why he could say with certain conviction and passion that my burden is easy and my yoke is light. Cast your cares upon me. So we think God doesn't care. When Jesus clearly does, he gave his life for us. God clearly cares. He gave his son holding anything. You think he's going to withhold the solution and the answer for you? Come on. From you. Operating operating out of the spirit of God is so simple. It's so easy. Not only that, but the devil can't touch you if you're in the spirit. He absolutely can't because he can't. Darkness cannot touch light. So what does he do? He tries to get you to resurrect your flesh so he can touch you, so he can mess with you and torment you and try to bring fear back in your life. And that's why it says in Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation. There's no fear. There's no anxiousness. There's no worry. And if you say that you are in Christ Jesus and you're having those things, then you're not abiding according to the spirit of God that he's placed within you. The very nature he's placed within you. So you're holding on to things that you shouldn't be holding on to. You've got to let him go. There was this lady in Brazil. I think I've shared the story with you. Maybe I have, maybe I haven't. She had fibromyalgia for, I think it was 20-something years. Fibromyalgia. Asked her on a pain scale. 
What's your pain level? She said 13. Now, we usually ask 1 to 10. So for her to say 13, it's a lot of pain. She went and grabbed the gift bag. And she came and poured out this gift bag, and there was tons of pain medications that she's supposed to take every day to mildly alleviate the pain in her body. And we prayed for her, and she got better. A little at a time, a little at a time. I said, nope, nope, something's off. Something's not right here. So I asked the team, pray for her. See, see, ask God what we need to do here. Immediately one of the team members jumped up and he said, I feel like God's saying that she has unforgiveness towards her father. And lo and behold, we didn't just find that she had unforgiveness towards her father. We found that it was her having unforgiveness towards herself concerning her father. It wasn't that she had unforgiveness towards her father. So we found out that she was a daddy's girl all her life. And she married her husband against her father's wishes, and she never reconciled with him before he passed. Because she never reconciled with him before he, she, he passed, she carried the weight and the guilt and the condemnation on her and it wreaked havoc in her body that was causing pain everywhere. And when you know what the word forgiveness means in Greek, it means to let go. If you're holding on to something, it just means you just let it go. And I can hear some of you say right now, I don't know how to let go. And just like holding on to something, the conscious choice, you resolve within yourself to let it go. To cast your cares upon Jesus. When you're giving it to Jesus, you don't pick it back up again. You leave it with Jesus. And so we told this lady about letting go. She said, we can't do this for you. It's something you need to do on your own. She immediately cries out to God right there in front of us. It was kind of awkward, to be honest with you. She cries out to God. As soon as she finishes crying out to God, I asked her, how are you now? And she was in complete shock because she had no pain. She was delivered from the torment. She was delivered from the bondage and the slavery that the devil had built up in her own mind. God took it all. And so when you look at this, you look at the understanding of, of what we're supposed to have and operate in as believers. So we're already spiritual. You do physical things, but you're spiritual. You're a spiritual being. You're not a spiritual doing. You're a spiritual being. And you do spiritual things because it's who you are. It's the very nature of who you are. You can't help help but share the good news because it's who you are. You can't help but heal the sick because it's who you are. You can't help but prophesy, give words of knowledge and words of wisdom, and cleanse the lepers and cast out demons because it's who you are. If you look at Jesus, that's who he, he is. Not even who he was. It's who he is. He hasn't changed. He's still alive. Two years. And we're fashioned into his image. We're made into his image. We're conformed into his image. And it's worth walking out daily. And it's absolutely amazing. I know we've gone, gone over a little bit in time, but Dorothy? <laughs> there we go. That was really good. <laughs> I think. Um... <clears throat> That that's a hard concept for many of us uh, to get a hold of. I think when we hear the word flesh, we just think of our body. We don't think of all that other stuff. So I thought that was a very good explanation. Yeah, it's something that God started pointing out to me. And honestly, you know, the early fathers, they believed. They they taught, you know. I, I actually found some of this stuff um, being directly re- referred to or related to 
by John Alexander Dowie and and several others. And so it just kind of let, sent me down a path where I began to realize it's not earned. You don't earn being spiritual. You already are spiritual. Yeah, we do turn that walking in the spirit into a chore. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, I've got to walk in the spirit today. How am I going to do that? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very true. But, <laughs> like, if, if if we just look at the life of Jesus, it's so simple. It's it's not complicated at all. It's just doing life with him. The The way he lived his life was completely selfless. Because his mind was on the spiritual things in the spiritual realm, which is what we do as Christians, you know? Yep. A serious Christian, yep, that's where their mind is. So it's one of those, like you said, an aha moment. It's like, duh, are you kidding me? It's that simple. Yes, it's that simple, people. <laughs> Yeah, and one of the things that we do a lot of times is we overcomplicate things. And we see that if we're truly, completely surrendered to God, then we're automatically obedient to Him. And we're obedient to Him because we absolutely trust Him and love Him. Because we love Him, we trust Him, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's just, I'm I'm sorry, I'm looking over here at Philippians chapter 2, in verse 5, it says, Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of the servant, being born in the likeness of men, or men, But being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And when you look at Jesus' mindset, his mindset wasn't to glorify himself or to make himself look good or anything like that. His mindset completely just to, to trust God. Walk with God. He did, he did things to glorify God because of his love for God. He did all these things. He didn't hold anything back. And it's it's basically what we adopt. As we put on Christ, we put on his thoughts, his emotions, his will, and his actions as if they're our own. And so Jesus made it very simple because we have accounts of, of how he walked, how he lived. And even if you look at, you know, 1 John chapter 4, Verse 17, this is the second part of that. It says, as he is, so are, so are we in this world. So it doesn't say how he was when he walked on the earth. It says how, how he is in his glorified state, how he is, so are we. And you see how all this ties together, all this comes together. And you begin to understand what Jesus accomplished. He accomplished a lot on that cross. He really did. Um, and by his resurrection, yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. One of the things I've been been sorting through the last week is I've been, you know how people say that you want to become more of him and less of you, and people get caught up in <clears throat> denigrating themselves because they're not, as good as him and they they just need to be more him and not themselves. Right, I was right. thinking in, in my little pea brain, that doesn't mean you disappear as a person. It's like that army slogan, you know, be the best you can be. And that's who you are when you follow after him wholeheartedly. And, and you take on all, bring out the best in you. If that makes sense. Yeah. Well, what you find is um, one. 
to pick on you a little bit. You kind of fulfilled exactly what you're talking against. Because <laughs> you said, <laughs> you don't have a seed brain. Because you're in the image of Christ, right? You are just right. like Christ. So one thing we don't realize sometimes is we talk down to ourselves. We're actually talking down to God because we're made in his image. And Ouch. But exactly, I know, when I read that from Creflo Dollar on his image, it, it tore me up. <laughs> so, but when um, the image of righteousness is named the book, sorry. But when we when we understand exactly what you're saying, we understand that God, what he's expecting from us is just to trust him and walk with him. He's, he's conforming you into the image of his son. He's not conforming you into the image of Anthony. So you're going to talk like Anthony, walk like Anthony, and do all those things like Anthony. No, no, no. He, he created you with your own personality. He created you with your own personality quirks. But for you to, to operate with that through him. See, because with, those, with these things, your personality and your personality quirks, you're able to reach people I can't reach. You're able to evangelize and share with different uh, circles of influence and and different people that I never would even associate with. And it, that goes to, to like every single person. You begin to realize God wants you to be yourself in Christ Jesus. Because you're Absolutely. Born, you're born into him. Right, it, it comes com- completely different because you're not struggling, striving to attain something, but you're at the place already, and you live out of that place. And that's probably one of the the biggest things the church has hard, had a hard time going into and understanding is it's not something that you have to struggle and strive to attain, but that you already have. You have every good thing pertaining to life and God. You have everything. God's not withholding anything. He's giving you everything. So it just becomes walking it up. Learning how to use the tools that God has entrusted to us. And the more that you do it, the easier it becomes. Because you would say that you are renewing your mind to how to actually operate with the tools that God has entrusted to us. So, for instance, if I take you to a job, Dorothy, and I say you've never swung a hammer, and I say, okay, I give you a hammer, what's going to happen within the first week? Almost guaranteed. You know? Going to hit your thumb. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you are. <laughs> and you're going to be so, you have a silver thumb, and you're going to not want to swing as hard, right? And then you start getting your aim down. Then it becomes natural to you, right? And this is yep. exactly the way it works with with things of the spirit. Is we think it's so hard and complicated, and we have to do this and do that. When all we have to do is simply be obedient to the word and walk out the word on a regular basis, and it becomes easier and easier and easier. Not harder and harder and harder. It becomes easier, becomes simpler, because we're understanding what we're doing and how we're doing it and how we can operate from that place. Absolute sense. Absolutely. So I know a lot of people, they're looking so for simple. formula. <laughs> yep. I don't give formula. formula. A plus <laughs> B equals C minus three. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But I don't give formulas because God never gives formulas. <laughs> but you see that all it is ultimately, again, as I've said, basically almost every week, is just complete surrender and trust in God. That's it. So do you have anything else, anything else Dorothy? Or No, no. I just – my mind is just extrapolating and, and I'm, I'm thinking – why do we, as human beings, hold on to things that we should have let go of a long time ago? I, I know this is something that we do as a matter of course. We hold on to our pain. We hold on to unforgiveness. 
it's just been something boiling in my mind lately. Yeah, and it and it's very true that that's part of the fleshly nature. Mhm. Right. But it's it's like a, an old story that Billy Graham gave um in one of his his biographies and basically it's he says that there was this man in the gold rush days in Alaska and he would come down from the mountains every week and he had this black dog and he had this white dog and he would let them fight and people from the town would go and they would bet on the dogs but he would always pick the winning dog and one of the guys became so curious on how he always knew which dog was going to win that he followed this guy around and he hounded him and he questioned him consistently. And finally, when the, the man was old, did you know what dog was going to win? He said, oh, it's simple. He goes, I don't see anything simple about it. Like, <laughs> what's your secret? <laughs> and the man just tells him, it's whatever dog I said that week. And this is someone puts it this way. Feed your faith and starve your doubts. Feed your trust in God. Starve everything else. Because whatever you're giving yourself to, that's what you become. That's why that I say so you're, true. Either, you're either a slave of your flesh, a slave of unrighteousness, or you're a slave of righteousness. There's no in between. And you begin to understand why Paul used that terminology of slave, bond servant of unrighteousness or bond servant of righteousness because he's referring to the very nature of us. Operating from the spirit, operating from the nature of righteousness. So if you're operating from the nature of righteousness, you keep no record of wrong. If somebody repents, you forgive them 70 times 7. Right? If they don't repent, you still forgive them. Because it has no place in your life. Because you're dead, remember? You're the wrong. And something that, that I was reading that E.W. Kenyon really brings out concerning Job is that in order for him to be healed, he had to extend mercy to his, his own friends. So as he prayed for his friends, then he was healed. So the people who came to him and and verbally abused him. The ones who told them, you know, basically, you know, you're doing wrong. There must be some hidden sin and, and questioned him and attacked him. And, and I mean, with friends like that, you don't know who needs enemies, right? Right. And he could have held on to business. He could have held on to everything against them. But he showed mercy. And because he showed mercy, God showed mercy upon him. And if we think about this, this is something Jesus actually taught. If you forgive, you will be forgiven. Right? If you let go, then the things that God has against you, he lets go of. So there's conditions. A lot of the things you probably won't hear in churches today, but it's clear in Scripture, clear in Jesus' teaching. And it's not complicated at all. It's actually very simple. Exactly. But so like many that. of us like don't, that. right, we don't hear it uh, when we're in the midst of the pain. And I think forgiving ourselves is one of the hardest things to do. Yep. And again, you just have to resolve in your, within yourself to to trust God, trust his word over what you're going through or what you've been through. I'm not saying bury it or deny that it ever happened. No. I'm saying you look to the Word of God and say, God, what do you say about this situation? And then you obey the Word of God. Because, you know, it basically it's like the Bible is basic instructions before leaving earth, right? <laughs> right. And it's kind of the, it's, it's the roadmap to how to actually operate in the spirit because Jesus is there and 
and from Genesis to Revelation, talking about Jesus. It's pointing to Jesus. And so when you see how he, he operated, how he walked, even when he was being crucified, when he was nailed on the cross, Dorothy, in the midst of all the pain, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. And that's our nature. That's what we have in Christ Jesus. Because when we realize or not, we become we come into bondage of unforgiveness and pain and resentment and, and bitterness if we dwell on it. Our when you're talking to yeah. <clears throat> when you're talking to people who are obviously holding on to something, how do you get through to them? Because I just had a friend who I've been saying the same thing to for two, three years now about a situation. And she couldn't hear it. And then finally someone else said it to her. And I know I wasn't the only one saying it to her. And she got it. It, it like was a two by four on the head. How, is there a way that we as Christians can help people move to that point any faster so they don't suffer so long? Yes. Yes. In fact, you'll find that the quickest way is by relationship with God. Now, and this is what I'm saying is because you're in relationship with God. Right? So since you're in a relationship with him, you hear God. You know his right. So when he tells you something, he's giving you insights. He knows. And there's something I didn't get to go into, but First Corinthians 12, uh, chapter 2, the mind of man except for the spirit of man. But the spirit of God sees the mind and the heart of every single person. So as we are submitting and we listen and we pay attention to what God's saying, he gives us insights on what to say and what to do. So that's where I say, you know, love, listen, discern, and respond. Because several times God told me something, and I'm like, wow, what do I, how do I deal with this? How do I address this? I have no idea. Because I'm just being completely honest and vulnerable with God, and God tells me, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to say. So, for instance, with this lady um, addressing unforgiveness, I'm right in front of her, and I said, this is what you're doing to God. And I grabbed something, and I said, here you go. And I and I gave it to her, so she grabs onto it. And as soon as she was starting to tighten her grip on it, I yanked it away. And I said, no, 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 no. And she just looked at me like, what? I go, okay, let's do it again. Here you go. And she starts to grab it, and I yank it back away from her. I go, no, no, no. And I do it again, and I do it again. She's like, okay, I get the point. <laughs> And I was like, this is what you're doing about. <laughs> you have to let go. And I handed it to her, and I let both of my hands go. And then she was like, I got it. And so just using something very physical to, you know, to, to get the concept or the idea. You know, I know a pastor that there was a, um, a person who had been dealing with divorce, and they were having a hard time letting go of the pain and and everything that they had went through. And he goes, you know what you're doing? And the person's like, no, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> that's the point. I can't hear God and blah, blah, blah. Right? Because that's, that's ultimately what they say. It's ultimately how you feel sometimes in, in, in moments of crisis and in different situations. And it's because we don't take time to be still before God, to listen to him and make time for him instead of dwelling on what happened to us. And so he says, this is what you're doing. And he says, they were, they were standing in their, this person's kitchen. She said, what are you thinking about? And the person said, well, I was, I was thinking about how they did this to me. And he said, okay. And he grabs a pot and puts a pot in the person's hand. So what else do you think about? Well, I think about how they did this and how they did this. And he starts filling their hands with all these things from the kitchen. He goes, this is what you're doing to yourself. And they were weighed down by all this pots and pans and everything else, and they're trying to hold on to everything. 
So imagine how silly it looked, right? And he goes, and imagine that I'm God, and he stepped back like 10 paces, and he pulled out $100 from his, his wallet, and he handed it, he holds it out, and he goes, it's yours if you can grab it. And the person immediately dropped everything, let go of everything, fell on the floor, and reached over and grabbed the $100 bill. Now, was that hard? He said, you had your hands so full, your mind so full of all the pain, the resentment, the unforgiveness, that it left no room for God's blessing. And it's, as you can tell, it's a story that's stuck with me to this day. I mean, it's something that he practically did. The Spirit of God gave him insight to deal with this person this way. So you see that every situation is different. In the Spirit of God, different things. He, he tells you to do different things. He, he, he brings the insight on how to unlock the person's heart. That, that's why I can tell you, you know, anybody who's been on our team, who's traveled with us, they can confirm. You know, whenever we give a prophetic word or we do a prophetic act or something like I just shared, the person who's receiving just is in tears and they're bawling and they're crying. And it's not because we're trying to hurt them or anything like that, but that God immediately touches their heart and heals the wounds of their heart. And it's absolutely amazing. Is it easier to do that when you're physically in the presence of the person instead of the phone? Um, I've done both. I've done both. So it, and honestly, what you find with being over the phone or being in person is what you believe yourself. If you believe that you need to be in front of the person, then be in front of the person if, it's, if possible. If you're over the phone, understand that your words are still powerful. They're just as powerful. God's word is so powerful as your words coming out of your mouth as it is when it comes out of his mouth. His word is just as powerful coming out of your mouth as it is when it comes out of his mouth. I said that right. Yes, you said that right. Okay, that was really helpful. Um, What are we going to learn about next week? Um, Next meeting, basically, I'm going to dive into grace. I'm going to tackle grace. So we're going to reveal truth on the word grace. And it's going to be a shocker because it's not what everybody thinks it is or the, what they, the idea that they think they have about it. And it reveals the very heart of God and, and everything he's actually accomplished through Jesus Christ. Because understanding grace allows you to operate from the grace and through the grace. So we're going to be revealing truth on grace next time we meet. That sounds awesome. And again, you see, it's simple and easy. Simple and easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I guess that's it for this week, everyone. Uh, have a blessed week till, well, it'll be two weeks until Anthony teaches again. And I hope to see you there. And Anthony, did you want to close out with a prayer? I'm definitely. So right now, okay. in Jesus' name, Father I, Father, I thank you for every single person in the sound of my voice, that they be healed, set free from the bondage and the lies and the condemnation that has lifted itself against them. And Father, we thank you for peace and reassurance and love and acceptance through Jesus Christ, that that becomes foremost evident in their heart, in their mind, that they operate in perfect union, in perfect harmony with your precious Holy Spirit, with your very nature abiding in them and through them by the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of Christ. And Father, we thank you for divine appointments this week. We thank you for the miraculous. We thank you for situations coming into alignment. 
We thank you, Father, that no devil in hell can stop them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Anthony. That was a wonderful lesson. And don't you just love it when I grill you at the end? (laughs) Oh, I actually enjoy that a lot. (laughs) Do do you? (laughs) Well, you have a good evening. I'll say good night. And everyone have a blessed two weeks. Uh, And we'll see you next time. Good night, Anthony. Good night, Dorothy. Good night, everyone. Bye.